morning. Can you all hear me well enough? I'll use my best 8 o'clock in the morning lecture voice. <laughs> At any rate, uh, wel welcome to this uh, ver very important forum. Uh, we will lighten up the, uh, uh, the gymnasium in a few minutes. We have a, a slide uh, presentation that will be part of it, so after that we'll put the lights on. The fundamental question today is who rules Lancaster? But it could be who rules New York, who rules Philadelphia, who, who rules Bedford, who rules whatever community you happen to reside in. And the questions in general before our panelists today are as follows. Why should students care about local government, about the larger local community? Why should you get involved? How should you get involved? But even more than that, how can you apply what you have learned here at Franklin and Marshall to the real world with its assortment of messy challenges? Today's common hour with four superbly qualified panelists will help provide some answers to these important questions and we obviously then encourage your questions at the appropriate time. The first to address these questions is Professor Stephen Medvick, Professor of Government. Before coming to Franklin and Marshall in 2002, he taught at Old Dominion University in Virginia. As most of us who uh, practice government, study government, we know that uh, Stephen is an expert on campaigns and elections, political parties, and public opinion. And his latest book is entitled In Defense of Politicians. That's not easy, so I applaud him for trying to do that. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Professor Medvick, first question to you. Many people think that we should not encourage, and maybe we should even actively discourage, college students from voting. What are the arguments for and against college students voting? Well, thanks, Terry. Can everybody hear? I, I want to start by saying um, that I'm in a a little bit of mourning today for the loss of the, uh, the Pirates yesterday in the, in the playoff <laughs> game. So if I'm a little more sad than usual, that's why. My, my Pirates season is over. Uh, but I want to answer this question by putting it kind of in a broader, broader context. Um, and so I'll try to do this as, as briefly as I can. But I think we're seeing uh, efforts to make voting more difficult uh, around the country. We're seeing more efforts to do this than we've seen at any other time since really the passage of the, the Voting Rights Act in, in 1965. In fact, there, according to the Brennan Center for Justice, there are 22 states that just since 2010 have put new restrictions on, on voting uh, on the books. Um, and some of these are being challenged in court right now, but, but many of these restrictions will be in place for the first time this fall. Uh, in the 2014 uh, midterm elections. These restrictions uh, in, in these 22 states v have, take a variety of forms. In some cases, they make uh, v registering to vote more difficult. Um, sometimes they reduce or eliminate early voting opportunities. And more controversially, they um, often, or sometimes at least, require uh, photo IDs to vote. Uh, now, I should say, to be fair, that 16 states, according to the Brennan Center, have expanded voting rights. So we really are seeing a national debate and, an, and a fight over voting rights um, to such an extent that we haven't seen since the 60s. The Supreme Court, as you may know, is, is sort of on the side of restricting access to the polls, or it has been for the last six or seven years. Uh, it started back in 2008 when they uh, upheld a, an Indiana law that had a very strict photo ID requirement. Uh, but just last year, they struck down part of the Voting Rights Act and as a result made it more difficult for the federal government to, to intervene to invalidate laws that might be, voting laws that might be discriminatory. In fact, just Monday, the, the Supreme Court intervened in a dispute in, in uh, Ohio, uh, and the result of that is to allow um, the state to shrink the, the amount of time available for, for early voting. So there's a big battle going on throughout the country uh, over voting rights. These new laws disproportionately affect the poor, uh, minorities, and students. And students, in particular, are affected by these photo, photo ID laws. Uh, because in several states, student IDs are not an acceptable form of ID to vote. Uh, you may know that in Texas, for example, that has now probably the strictest photo ID requirement, 
in Texas, uh, a permit to carry a concealed weapon is a valid ID to vote, uh, but a student ID is not. So uh, the efforts to restrict access to the polls, you could say, is just simply a, a partisan move, that the debates over voting rights is just partisanship. Uh, with maybe Republicans trying to, to constrict it to, or, or to suppress Democratic votes, and Democrats, of course, wanting to expand it as wherever they can because that will help, help them at the polls. But I think there are two arguments that get made, and we should take them seriously, one of, one of which is not, I think, always sincere. Another one is very sincere. The one that's maybe a little less sincere is that these laws, and in particular uh, photo ID laws, are necessary to prevent voter fraud. Um, the reason this is maybe not a sincere argument is because there's very little voter fraud uh, in the United States. There's, there's very little election fraud. There's virtually no uh, voter fraud of the type that photo ID laws would, would uh, account for or would take, uh, take care of. Um, the more serious, I think, claim though, and it's one you won't hear uh, publicly very often, but if you kind of scratch the surface of, of, of those who want to restrict voting rights, I think this underlies their, their, their reasoning or their, their efforts, uh, is that we, we probably ought to make it a little bit difficult to vote because by doing so we can keep certain kinds of voters from voting. And, we're, and the kinds of voters that they have in mind are not necessarily described as poor or minority or students. It, what they have in mind is people who are maybe not that well informed or not that engaged in politics. So the argument is if we put some barriers in place, only people with the wherewithal, uh, meaning the interest or the, the knowledge uh, of politics, to vote will make it over those barriers. And as a result, there, that, this claim is that we really will get better election outcomes because the outcomes will be based on an informed electorate, not just all voters. Um, so this is what justifies, I think, restrictions on, on students, that they, typically, they argue that, look, they typically don't have deep roots in the community where they go to school, uh, and so they don't know enough about local politics to, to, to cast an informed vote. Furthermore, they're not likely to live in the community where they go to school, so they don't have a long-term interest in that community. And so while we don't want to maybe say they legally are banned from voting, if we put some barriers in place, it'll be hard for them to vote, and then we avoid them casting uninformed uh, ballots. I think students, you know, you could make an, the other argument though, which is that students live for most of the year uh, in the community where they go to school, uh, you know, roughly eight months out of the year, except for winter break and summer break. Uh, and, and they live in that community for four years. It's a really long time to be in a community and the, the local governance affects them uh, in, in, in really important ways. Furthermore, very few of them are going to move back home after they graduate, uh, unless it's just temporary. Sometimes that does happen, I know. Uh, but they, you know, they're not moving back home necessarily, and so they don't have long-term long commitment to that community either. So saying they ought to vote at home but not at school doesn't make uh, much more sense. So students really ought to be allowed, I think, to decide for themselves where they feel uh, more connected, whether it's their parents' community or their school, and they should be, and, and the college, of course, should encourage them to vote here if that's where they'd, where they'd like to vote. Just finally, and I'll wrap up, I want to put in a plug for students voting at school, though. Um, not only because they're affected by, by local governance, but because there's a lot of political science research that shows that voting is habit forming. That the best indicator of whether you're going to vote this fall is whether you voted in the past. So at some, times you've got, at some point in time, you've got to start that habit of voting. And I think it's probably better to do that while you're at school and you can vote in person because voting uh, at home by absentee ballot may not have the same sort of effect. So we could see this as part of the educational mission of the college and, and students ought to see it as part of their education to learn the habits of democracy by voting uh, where they go to school. Thanks, and just building on that uh, excellent summary, uh, Pennsylvania's voter ID law, which required seven forms, particular forms of voter identification was ruled unconstitutional by uh, a, an appeals court, the Commonwealth Court in this state, and the governor and the administration has decided not to appeal it. So you will not be asked when you go to vote this year to supply a, one of those seven forms of identification uh, as we talk about FNM votes and getting students uh, actively engaged. Our second uh, presenter today is Professor Antonio Kalari, he's uh, the Sigmund M. and Mary B. Hyman Professor of Economics, until recently as the director of the Franklin and Marshall 
local economy center. For those of us here, we would read uh, very often in the, local, in the local press and on television the results of Antonio's uh, research. Many of the students who on the floor of the building uh, across the way here uh, that, I'm, that Stephen and I reside in are up there doing that research all the time, which we uh, certainly enjoy. Before his work at the local economy center, he was a community activist. He was chair of the Lancaster Rainbow Coalition that put him involved in city politics and one of the founders of the Community First Fund, which was one of the most successful micro credit community finance economic development organizations in the, in the country. Well, obviously, Professor, one question to you as someone who's been actively engaged, who rules Lancaster? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Thierry. And my apologies for keeping us in the dark up until Jimmy now. It's because slides, right? <laughs> I'm going to be showing some slides, and we were holding the lights down yeah. uh, because of that. So, um, and I, I came prepared to uh, answer the question of who rules Lancaster. But before I get into that, let me say that I don't mean to point to particular people, uh, name any names, uh, and not even uh, talking about who rules Lancaster uh, politically in terms of making the decisions that then affect the lives of people, the elected officials. I mean more to address the question of what are the powerful forces at work that shape the politics and the culture of this community, uh, and that set the stage then for the political uh, leaders to act and make the decisions that affect uh, us all, uh, and that affect uh, students in particular, because I'm going to use as an example, as a most pertinent example, how this community has made decisions about educating its young people. Uh, I understand and I see that there is a, a number of high school students who are visiting us here today. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about how this community has thought about educating you. Uh, and that's obviously of interest, I hope, to other students who are not from here, but who are in college uh, right now and who have a direct interest and a direct understanding of the importance of of education, uh, and they can apply that to their well-being, to the well-being of their fellow young people in this community, and to the well-being of people everywhere in the country. So uh, it's an important question of governance. How do we go about educating our young people? So what are the special forces uh, at work that have had an influence uh, on this question? And um, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, they say. So I'm going to start with that picture right there. Money. Uh, I'm an economist, uh, and so this is perhaps, you know, not surprising. Uh, but by money, I don't necessarily mean who has the most money. Uh, that's not really uh, the key here. Uh, the key to a community, I think, insofar as the economics is concerned, is more around the question of how do the people who make money in a community do it? Uh, and this is a community where, in fact, uh, a lot of money is made. This is a, a good community in which uh, businesses come to make money. It's renowned for that. It's a good business uh, environment. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, start with that. Um, I've been in meetings uh, where, in fact, business people have said that. This is a good community for us. People know that this is a place where you can come and make money. So the question uh, is, why is that the case? Um, there are a number of reasons why Lancaster is a quote-unquote, you know, good economic site for businesses to locate in. The location is important, it's blessed with resources. Uh, but there is one reason in particular that I want to point to, other than these other reasons, which I think goes to the questions that I'm trying to get at. And that is that Lancaster is, is it working? Uh, 
uh, that Lancaster is a place where wages tend to be lower than in other areas. And what you have there is occupational wages. And what the table here shows is what wages in Lancaster are relative to the region, which is other counties uh, surrounding Lancaster County. That's the column before the last. And then the last column uh, compares wages in Lancaster with what they are in the state of Pennsylvania as a whole. And if you look at uh, those two columns, you will see a lot of red numbers. And each time there is a red number there, it means that the people in Lancaster from a certain occupation, management, business and finance operations, legal, uh, sales and related uh, occupations, where there is a red number in those uh, two columns, it means that people in Lancaster working in those professions uh, earn less than people uh, working in those professions earn uh, elsewhere. So this is kind of strong evidence that people in Lancaster for the same jobs get paid less here than they do elsewhere. While it makes sense that if people get paid less, businesses are left with more money that they can keep as profits. Uh, so this is a good place to do business indeed. May not be so good for the workers, but it is a good place to do business. Um, another piece of evidence about uh, people in Lancaster getting paid less than elsewhere. Let me see if this works properly. Yeah. Here. This is another picture of the distribution of uh, wage rates uh, across the working population. And what you see on, on uh, uh, the axis there is wage rates that people get paid starting from around 15 all the way up to 80, 90 dollars. The data stops at 80 dollars you know, per hour. Um, but you can see that there, those lines there are tracing um, kind of the way the distribution goes for three different areas. Uh, the blue area is the state of Pennsylvania. Some of the labels got messed up here a little bit in the transmission of the PowerPoint uh, slides onto this computer. But um, if you take a look at that, the blue line tells you about the distribution of uh, wage rates across the labor force in Pennsylvania. Uh, the red line talks about the distribution of wage rates um, across the labor force in the region. And the green line talks about the distribution or illustrates the distribution of wage rates uh, across the labor force in Lancaster. And you can see how in the state of Pennsylvania and in the region, other counties around us, in fact, people move into the higher paying jobs much more quickly than they do here. Uh, the green line there is the bottom kind of edge of that uh, distribution for Lancaster. So more people here are working at lower wage rates and they're not moving, the, 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 the labor force is not moving into the higher uh, wage uh, rates uh, ranges as quickly as it is in other areas. Another important piece of evidence, uh, and there is more, I'm just bringing these two here. There's lots of evidence to indicate that people here don't get paid, you know, as well as they do in other areas. And uh, what that means, by the way, is that uh, there is uh, a good explanation. There is a good explanation for why it is uh, that businesses here uh, make money more than elsewhere, why we have such a, a good reputation as a place in which to make money. Uh, we can squeeze more out of the workers here. Businesses tend to squeeze more out of the workers here than elsewhere. So that's a little cartoon there to make that point. But, um, okay, um, uh, an outcome is um, right there, is that per capita income uh, in Lancaster has been falling uh, behind the per capita income in the country. Uh, the red line there shows you how 
the average person's income uh, or income available per person has been increasing throughout the country. We can see that in Lancaster, it hasn't been increasing as much uh, as elsewhere. All the evidence, again, points that the reason for that is the lower wages that are being paid here in the county. Okay, now, what does this have to do with Wolves Lancaster? I wanna suggest that, in fact, the employers, the business community here that, right, is been benefiting from being able to hire people at lower wage rates, right, have been employing uh, people uh, and are looking for people who will be willing to work without asking higher wage rates, without placing too many demands. And there is a certain aspect of the conservatism of this community that would explain why people here would accept working at lower wage rates than elsewhere. Uh, but there is also uh, an element that uh, pertains to the level of education that people here have and to the culture of education that has been permeating uh, this community. And here we can find out that in fact this community has not invested very much in education, has not invested as much as other communities have in education. So um, there is evidence about that too, and that's where we come to policy. That's where we come to the question of, you know, what kind of decisions are being made here that impact the lives of people. Uh, who really, what kind of interests rule, right, Lancaster? What kind of interests get to say how well we educate our people, how much money we put into an educational infrastructure? So here's the evidence. This chart shows you that we have underinvested, for example, in our library system. Looking for evidence about, you know, have we taken educating people seriously? Have we taken education seriously? Have we taken knowledge seriously? Have we taken the knowledge infrastructure seriously? This says that we haven't. We haven't invested in our libraries, for example, as much as other areas have. And what's the outcome? Well, the outcome here is that, in fact, people are not as well educated in Lancaster as they are in other places. Um, if you take a look at what this chart here is telling you, Lancaster is at the bottom right there. And uh, uh, the uh, blue and uh, green uh, uh, parts of the bars there indicate the percentage see of the population, which is uh, 25 and above, right, whose degree stops at high school. Uh, beyond that, you begin to talk about post high school education. Uh, some college or uh, college degrees or higher level uh, degree. And you can see here that the percentage of the population in Lancaster that has higher levels of education is considerably less than in other areas. Uh, that doesn't happen without there being a certain cultural framework, a certain policy framework within which people approach the question of education. And people just don't go to college around here as much as they do in other places. Sometimes people say, oh, that's because of the Amish. But these numbers are corrected for the Amish, right? This, so this is the way in which right, people in Lancaster Right, excluding the Amish, uh, have been getting different levels of education here. And so even taking into account the Amish, even removing the Amish from the picture, we have an educational attainment deficit in Lancaster. Why is that? I'm suggesting it's because the leaders in this community have decided not to promote education, not to promote higher education, college education as much as elsewhere. Let me give you a little example. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, the Star Library System of Lancaster County was able to place a question on a ballot. Um, and the question was, uh, should there be a poll tax to support the uh, library system? A poll tax of about $1.50 to $2 uh, per person. And uh, that uh, proposal was defeated uh, at the polls. Uh, there were people for it and people against it. 
The Chamber of Commerce was against it. Why would the Chamber of Commerce be against the idea of increasing funding to the library? If in fact they had been supported by businesses that wanted people with skills, that wanted people with education, they wouldn't have defeated that proposal. They wouldn't have lobbied against it. The reason why they took it upon themselves to oppose that proposal, to fund the library system better, which would have been kind of a show of public investment in a better educational knowledge infrastructure environment, right? Uh, the reason that they opposed it is because their members, right, didn't have an interest in promoting the education of the people in Lancaster County. Um, uh, so, um, I think that the question of how we invest uh, in education is a question of Wood Rules Lancaster, and I kind of making the case that it's the employers of, of Lancaster that have been calling the shots behind the scenes. Thank you. Our, our next presenter is uh, Candace Roper. She grew up in New York City and received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Earlham College in French and English. Uh, she lived in France, uh, where she worked for National Geographic Society and then moved to Lancaster from Paris. We ought to hear about that experience. Uh, talking about cultural shocks, I would presume. Uh, and uh, she's lived on West James Street, uh, very close to the college for almost a quarter of a century. She has a daughter studying molecular genetics at the University of Vermont. Maybe she knows my grandson, who's also a science major <laughs> at the University of Vermont. She has a son who's a junior at J.P. McCaskey High School and Let There Be Light, and there's light. Uh, we have that in common. My daughter is a graduate of J.P. McCaskey, so we've got all that going on. All right, look, let's, let's start with the fundamental here. The next two, this presenter and the next presenter, are both elected officials. You're not well paid in this. In fact, one of you isn't paid at all. School board directors are not paid in the state. Why? did you do this? Why did you want this job? Um, well, I, I think I'm going to give a shout out first to the McCaskey students who are here <laughs> and their teachers. Um, <laughs> and also to anybody else in the room who's a McCaskey grad, who's gone to our schools, who has kids in our schools. Um, my daughter graduated from J.P. McCaskey. My son is there now. Um, I guess I'll just tell the story of how I was elected to school board, which is still sort of surprising. Um, I had kids in the district. I volunteered a fair amount at the schools. I really have to admit that I was never interested in how school boards functioned or even local government was not ever something I was really interested in. I had never, well, I guess the only politician I'd ever spoken to was I found myself in the, um, the garden of the Elysee Palace in Paris. I was on a photo shoot with a photographer with the president of France. Um, and there was supposed to be no interview. It was just me and the photographer. And suddenly I hear him saying, loosen him up. <laughs> and um, so we st I started walking with Francois Mitterrand, the president at the time. <laughs> We were in the garden with his black Labrador retriever who was eating geraniums off of their stems and he was yelling at the dog whose name was Baltic. And I just found myself thinking, oh my God, what am I gonna say to him? And, and Jim, the photographer is saying, chat him up. So the first thing that came out of my mouth was, I really like the pyramid. And at that time in Paris, well, actually the whole country was sort of up in arms and was horrified at the idea that a glass pyramid was built in the courtyard of the Louvre. And I actually thought it was fantastic and knew enough to know that um, when the Louis were kings, they actually often set up p temporary pyramids. So it had historical value. So anyway, I awkwardly told him how much I loved the pyramid, thinking, oh my god, you idiot. And his face broke into an absolute beam and I heard the photographer saying, excellent, keep going. <laughs> so anyway, that was really the only time I ever, and I wasn't really thinking of politics or his job, although I did, it did make me realize that he like, made this decision and the whole country was sort of mad at him for it. Um, so I was asked to run for school board. School board is an elected position. I knew little to nothing about it. I was asked by some local... Um, Democrats, if I would be willing to run, and um, 
I really couldn't, I, I thought, what am I gonna do, say no? And I couldn't think of a good reason to say no, so I said yes and found myself running, and then I found myself elected. And then overnight, one finds oneself going from being, I was just like a single mom with two kids in the district, not knowing anything really about how the district was run, and I suddenly found myself in the position of helping to make the decisions to run it. Um, I don't think most people know or care much about school boards, but in Lancaster at least, um, there are nine of us. We are totally unpaid. There are no perks um, other than an occasional dinner. Um, there are nine of us so that in a vote, it will never be tied. Um, you are not re really required to have any background in it, which is really interesting. So it's very much a citizens get elected to do a job that's you know, important in some people's eyes. I think it's important because we have 11,000, more than 11,000 kids in this district. Um, and so it's really interesting. And our meetings are governed by the Sunshine Act, um, which means that we, the nine of us can never discuss anything unless we are in a public meeting, which makes a really interesting dynamics. It often makes us look like we're very disjointed and not on the same page, and it's because we're not, and until we're in front of an audience with microphones to discuss things, and we have no idea what the other people are gonna say or what they're thinking because we're not really allowed to discuss it. So it's an interesting um, dynamic, and it's, an, it's a really interesting um, experience to be part of democracy in all its imperfections. Mm -hmm. um, that's what okay. I got. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. The next uh, individual, uh, Deneen Sirachi, is a uh, currently a consultant at the Grove Foundation, which is based in uh, California. She has 20 years of experience in nonprofit administration and philanthropy. While most of her work is national and focused, uh, Deneen has served in various capacities in Lancaster City. Last year, last year, right, you were elected to uh, uh, city council. She has a bachelor's degree in psychobiology from Albright, we'll forgive her for not going to F&M. Uh, and a master's degree from uh, Rutgers University. The same question to you, and you know, one of the things I think we ought to get to is, are you, are you motivated by some sense of civic and public? You know, a lot of that is learned. You know, you, you grow up in a family where, and here at Franklin and Marshall, we're saying to the students here, get involved in a community, get involved. We don't care precisely what you do, Get, as Stephen often says, get involved in politics. We don't care what it is. Give something back to the community. Was that a, a big motivator for you? Thank you, um, and thank you for having me on today's panel. I, yes, it was a motivator for me, and, and you know, hindsight being 2020, I can look back at my growing up experience, and I can remember going to the polls with my parents at a very young age, and then um, having the opportunity to cast a ballot um, and the first, um, my first vote was, I get to vote for who the President of the United States was, and that was a big deal um, for me. I have to say, when I was in college, you know, I was doing the absentee ballot thing. I wasn't voting necessarily in Reading, and I was pretty disconnected from local politics um, during those four years. Um, a few years later, I moved to New Jersey and became uh, really involved with um, a woman who, whose husband was the Associate Director of Communications in the Kennedy Administration, and she helped to establish the Kennedy School with uh, Jacqueline Kennedy. And it was through her experience at that pivotal moment of history of being involved in and around with, um, the White House that got me really in engaged in politics in a new way. And she was always inviting me to the Eagleton Institute for Women in Politics talks at Rutgers University. And I had the opportunity to meet a lot of, of um, really remarkable people. Ann Richards, um, former governor of Texas, made a big impression on me. Um, it's hard not to. Um, she's um, pretty legendary. And in the process of getting to meet particularly women leaders, um, it, it kind of occurred to me like, well, maybe I'll run for office, but it didn't, it wasn't like on my horizon as like a job that I was seeking out and that my, my path in life was gonna take me down um, this particular road. 
And then when I moved back to Lancaster, Pennsylvania's home for me, um, I got involved in an initiative uh, related to green infrastructure. Okay, I knew nothing about green infrastructure. Maybe you don't either. But we in the city of Lancaster have a combined sewer system and about a billion gallons of storm water, especially when it rains, it overwhelms our system. And that polluted storm water goes into uh, Conestoga River, flows into the Susquehanna, heads on down to the bay. And we are responsible for cleaning that up. And the um, EPA has given us 25 years to do it. It was in the process of um, working with an organization um, then known as Live Green, now part of the Lancaster County Conservancy, that I became part of the process of developing a plan, um, putting together policy proposals, and then um, subsequently having the opportunity in February to vote on that proposal, which, you know, was a mixed bag because basically what it means is that property owners pay more um, because now there's a stormwater fee that's based on the size of your property and um, how much impervious surface you have. So meaning like if you have a house, a small house, you're paying maybe $30 a year, but if you have a large parking lot and all that water's running off, you're paying thousands. It was a really interesting experience for me because here I was, I was very interested in environmental issues just personally, not having a lot of experience in it, but learning fast. And then having to come up with a policy solution that was equitable, that was a, that attended to the various issues of um, property owners here in the city of Lancaster. And we have a um, concentrated population of folks who live on limited or uh, low income residents. And what were the implications going to be for those folks, as well as the people who we want to continue to invite to do business in the city, related to um, future development. And so how do we come up with the most equitable strategy? And so it was a, an eye-opening experience going through that process. And um, as I stepped down from my role with the, at the Lancaster County Conservancy, a few months later I was asked to step in for a council member who had decided not to run after the primary. And so, you know, I gave it 48 hours of thought, and I was like, you know what, this is four years of public service to the community that I've come to know and to love, and I want to be that steward of resources and, a, and provide um, a thoughtful perspective on the kinds of issues that come before our city council on a regular basis. And so, yes, I am motivated by the greater good, and I think that's okay. And, um, you know, it's been a steep learning curve since January. Well, we have uh, only 2,500 elected officials in this state, so <laughs> at the local level. So there's a lot that can be done, which leads me to a question for Stephen. But before I do that, anybody want to respond to anything that was said before? We Go ahead. I do. Go ahead. Go so ahead. Um, I really appreciated Professor, uh, Professor Kalari's uh, uh, who rules Lancaster and that employers are the rulers. Um, I would like to make a friendly amendment to that, which is um, there's a lot about decisions related to investment um, and how decisions are made that are set by our state elected officials. And one of the most, uh, and, and certainly uh, Candace can talk about this, but I'm a parent of a third grader at Fulton Elementary School, and I have seen um, the implications of inequitable funding and the very last minute um, task that the school board is given to not know how much money they're working with uh, at the end of the school year and beginning the next fiscal year. And these decisions about how we equitably distribute income to schools who have a lower tax base is a fundamental reason why, I believe, that we have lower rates of educational achievement in Lancaster. And I think that to let Harrisburg off the hook and to just say that it's the employers is not quite the whole story. The other thing that I would like to say about that is pension reform. The inability of our leaders in Harrisburg to take on municipal pension reform, it's, it's been not discussed. You'll hear it and you'll think that they're talking about police and fire, but they're not. They're talking about state employees and teacher unions. Their inability to take that on is dramatically affecting our ability to meet the fundamental needs 
um, in our community. And I think that those decisions and the impact of Harrisburg and their lack of action on some of the fundamental issues about how resources are allocated is very important to add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Just as a footnote to that, the go ahead, you're allowed to applause. <laughs> I, th I think we're reliving one of the big issues in the governor's debate yes. uh, at the moment. <laughs> at, any, at any rate, the two pension systems that uh, you were referring to have pushing a $60 billion debt, 60 billion, and it's 20% on average, you take the 500 school districts, the average debt or the average pension payment is 20% of the school district's budget in this state some more, some less. So if you take health care, you're talking about 25 to 30 percent of the budgets of schools that are already locked into fixed costs that don't go to educate, as we like to say, the kids. Uh, Stephen, a question for you. We, you. You spend a good bit of your life studying government, the state government, federal government. Is local government sort of the lost area where, you know, it, it has in some ways the most immediate and direct impact from police, the garbage collection, the property taxes at school that folks have to pay to the schools, the highest tax that people pay, the most unpopular tax anywhere is the school property tax. What, what impact is that having? Why should students here at this college get involved in, in local government? It, whether it's advisory, whether it's going into the community and assisting in a whole variety of, of civic engagement programs that f and sponsors that, that we put on here? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, arguably, the, the decisions that get made that have the biggest impact on your everyday life are made, you know, at the local level. The, it's easy to kind of follow the national, to follow national politics mm -hmm. and state politics because there's a lot of media covering politics at those levels. And a lot of times the, the issues there are, are um, kind of sexy um, and, and symbolic, largely, often. Um, and so they're interesting to, to talk about and to think about. But the, the, the things that happen at the local level uh, have a real impact on your quality of life, uh, the way you live your life every day. I mean, look, if, if Ferguson and the events in, uh, of Ferguson this summer uh, tell us anything, it's that local government and local politics matters tremendously. And that if a large portion of the population uh, is disenfranchised or alienated, uh, from local politics and local government, it has disastrous uh, consequences for the community. So no matter what you think happened in Ferguson and what your position on what happened in Ferguson is, you, I don't think anybody can deny that, um, that, th that the issues that are being grappled with there are, are vitally important uh, and that it is important for, for every member of the community to, to have a role in what the, what, what the vision of that community mm -hmm. uh, is going to be. So whether it's policing and public safety, you know, uh, housing and zoning ordinances, transportation. Um, there's a whole whole economic development. Um, if you want to be able to go downtown and go to, to good restaurants and, and have fun on first Fridays, and you know that that's a vision for how the community ought to uh, ought to ought to operate. And and I would argue that you know there there are competing views about what any local community should be like, um, and those those views get hashed out in campaign local campaigns, and so. I mean, I think it's of, of vital importance yeah. for, for students to, to pay attention and to be involved in local communities or local politics because it affects them and their everyday lives. Yeah, I mean, what the obvious purpose of this forum is to, I think, talk a little, a bit about, not a little bit, but almost exclusively about how students can get involved and why they should get involved. Let me go to the two elected officials. I mean, you live in a world of mandates and state and federal requirements, which, you know, Many of them well-meaning, I think you would agree. Many of them important, but they bring costs for which you're not reimbursed for, which spill over into your ability to deliver services. How vital are the civic and other community engagements that a whole host of community groups play in assisting what you do? Either one. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, one of the, uh, well, one of the most awful parts of being on a school board is that we have to balance our budget and if we make cuts, which we inevitably have to do, we have to cut entire programs. We can't cut a teacher here or a part of a program there. And we also can't cut any programs that are man state mandated. 
Um, so for instance, art, the arts are not mandated. There are no standardized tests. I personally feel like the arts in our school district are one of the greatest parts of our district and I would be really hard pressed to make cuts, but we're f we are forced at times to cut things we don't want to cut and that means an entire program. So the arts are not at all in jeopardy as long as I have anything to do with it. Um, but it does present us with interesting uh, dilemmas and fortunately in the school district of Lancaster we have a lot of great community partners. Um, Lancaster General, for instance, donates a million dollars to the district, which, and they also work with various programs on nutrition and exercise. Um, our schools, more and more, one of the phenomenon in um, urban school districts is because of the poverty which we deal with, which affects our students in so many ways, from not being able to concentrate because they're hungry to not having a steady home. So schools are becoming community schools and are providing more and more services to the families of students. Um, we have ESL classes in a lot of our schools. Um, we have all kinds of services. Den kids can go for their dental checkups. Um, I, they go to the optometrist, they get glasses. So even though <laughs> maybe nobody designed thought that schools would be dealing with that, we are, and particularly in urban districts, we're trying to address a lot of different issues that affect our kids so that they can do better in their studies and concentrate, um, and that brings into play a lot of community organizations, and we're lucky to have a lot really step up to the plate and help us with that. Mm -hmm. you know, before we open it up, one last question for you, and Antonio. Look, one of the things that, you know, when I notice when I go up to the third floor of Harris, you're, you, you know, you've got all kinds of students engaged in that kind of research that, you know, there are all kinds of ways to make a contribution. I think you would agree, whether you can go out and you know, participate in a service project in the community, but also for our students to do the kind of research that you've done over the years. How, how, how valuable has that been, not just to the community, but to the students in terms of what they do when they leave uh, F&M? Extremely valuable. Many of them have developed a, a love, a passion for doing that type of research uh, because it's become an educational experience for them more than just a grade, more than just being in a class. It's almost being members of a research community. They work on this research for a period of two years, so they develop mm -hmm. uh, a sense of what it means to take on a project and nurture it you know, over the long term, as opposed to just taking a class. Right. So it's a really formative experience, and they have benefited significantly from it. And that's how students benefit generally by being involved in the community, right? right? Because it's not just a class, it's something that they can feel inside their souls. Uh, and uh, it's very important, it's a very important part of how people grow and mature intellectually and personally and right. socially. I, I did wanna say uh, something in connection with what uh, Ms. Sarace said before. Uh, and, and just to clear what I was saying, I, I don't doubt for a second that policy at the state level and even at the national level and even at the international level, you know, has something to do with the situation that we find ourselves in in any uh, local community. Uh, but that puts an even greater pressure on the local people and the local people who have the power to do the right thing. Uh, so if there is um, a problem with the way the state funds I would expect that people with power in this community would use their power, would use their voice, right, to work against the problem, to remediate the problem. If we don't get enough fair funding for schooling because of what happens in Harrisburg or uh, in uh, uh, Washington, I would ex expect the local business community to have supported a library funding uh, kind of proposal. Uh, so in the face of these larger forces, I think it becomes more important for the people who have power, right, to do the right thing. Not to use the presence of the larger forces as an excuse for why things are as bad as they are. Uh, it really is very important. It is a matter of conscience, not a matter of convenience. Uh, and, and the data that I had there, for example, about lack of educational attainment, that was for Lancaster County as a whole, not just for the city where there is a concentration 
of poverty. And we're, in fact, funding issues and fairness are particularly uh, felt. And I think the local educators are doing the job, the best job that can be done. I trust them. I support them. I don't question them for a second. I do doubt that the environment, though, is one that is propitious to their being successful at educating the kids. Yeah. And the local leaders have a special responsibility to make that work better. And if they don't, it's a political fault of them. OK, thank you. Uh, it's your turn. Questions, come to the microphone. Come on up. Name, don't be bashful. We have about uh, 10 minutes left. You all going to sit there? Oh, here comes someone. Well, uh, while the uh, questioner is coming up, I want to point out that Lancaster, the city is actually fairly healthy as cities go in our state. We're not one of those so-called distressed cities. I think it's got a vibrant cult cultural, historical, economic uh, uh, growth going on. So amidst the problems that the city faces, comparatively speaking, the, the city of Lancaster and the school district are certainly in better shape than many other cities and school districts in the state. Yes, go ahead. Um, hi. My name is Fatu, and I'm from Brooks College House. I'm majoring in government and business. Um, and I think I have to like first apologize if my question anyhow um, offends you or anyway. But like, as a government major, um, like for many of us here who also are passionate about social change and, tr and trying to impact our communities, and when people ask us, oh, do you want to go into politics? Many of us said no, because politics corrupts. And that's one idea that's way away from necessarily being elected or like running or some kind. And then, so like I have a question for you, the elected officials, because you mentioned that sometimes you, you are forced to do something that you don't necessarily want to do. Like, uh, such as cutting funding for arts or of some kinds. And uh, the, the comments that the professor just made has elected official in a local government. How, I guess, like, do you respond to the comments that the politics corrupts because you feel like the bigger powers and the national and state governments are not really allowing you to do what you are elected to do in the first place? Elected officials. So I totally get the, you know, we were just having the conversation at the beginning, you know, that I'm a politician now. And I'm like, oh, I just like that. That just hurts a little bit in some way. Okay. Um, I, I like to think Stephen of myself. Stephen said it's okay. Yeah. He'll help, <laughs> Embrace he'll it, he'll help right? you out. He'll help um, you out. <laughs> because that comes with, you know, just like all of these um, frameworks, mental frameworks about what does that mean to be a politician and, and how you respond and how you conduct yourself. Um, and I think that the thing that's different, I've been on lots of nonprofit boards and so on, the things that's different about being an elected official is that you do answer to the public. And as Candace was saying, you're having these conversations and you're trying, you're, you're in the process of spinning out your, your thinking about a topic, an issue in in view of the public. And some of that happens behind the scenes, of course, but the kind of discourse that I think we should expect from our elected officials, I don't know if you've gone to some of the meetings, but sometimes it happens, but a lot of times it doesn't. And so I think that if I'm getting to your question about, you know, what's the challenge with that, or how do we, um, how do we sort of, live in this political environment when there's all these other forces and still make the best decisions, I think that's one of the things that's attracted me to local government because I actually feel like what I'm doing is affecting not just me and my family because we live in the city, but my friends and neighbors and the community at large. And it's much more direct and tangible. Like somebody calls me and says they have a pothole like, okay, I know what to do about that. I can call the director of public works and I can make sure that they know about it. It doesn't automatically get fixed the next day. Or I, uh, we're at F&M, I'll be totally frank. Lots of calls about the house at the corner of um, Walnut and Charlotte Streets. <laughs> lots, of call, lots of letters about <laughs> James Street, Frederick Street, 
corridors, uh, late at night, trash, loud noise, etc. You, you know, this is a college community, I get it. But I would say that one of the things that is really um, important to me to, and I recognize, and I don't know if other people see it this way too, there's a very close symbiotic relationship between the strength of our community and its livability and how well we recognize that we live in close connection with other people and we need to be respectful that people might be sleeping at 2 a.m. Um, with all of the great things that are happening in the city, people are wanting to move into the city and that is driving more expansion related restaurants and economic development and so on. It also means that it's much more inviting for students to come to a community like this because there's more amenities available for you. So when I first came to Lancaster, there was one hotel, it was the Hotel Brunswick, mm, not so much. And now you have lots of great choices in terms of when your friends, family, guests come to town. The other thing that I would say is that there's a symbiotic relationship just spreading this out from your walking down James Street to the health and well-being and vitality of the city to the county, to the state. So there's a really close symbiotic relationship between the strength of the city as the urban center in Lancaster County as with the county as a whole. And I really see that. So if, as the strength of Lancaster City has gotten better, the county is also benefiting from that as well. So I, I, I think that local government has attracted me to being a politician because of these very direct connections to people's lives. Good point. Any other questions? Stephen, why don't you... Res yeah, sure. Other questions? Come on up. Yeah. I, I, Come. I think that being a politician ought to be understood as uh, more than just being an elected official because there are many different ways of being elected, uh, of being involved in politics and being a politician than being an elected official. And behind the elected officials, there are all the ward leaders that do political work in the community. There are the community organizations that push for certain types of laws as opposed to certain other types of laws that create movements that then force uh, elected officials to face local uh, changes to, to meet the challenges. Martin Luther King was a politician. Yeah. Malcolm X was a politician. Uh, it's not just the elected officials. So being involved in politics is not just running for office, but it's talking to people on the ground to create political movements. Right. That's the meaning of politics, I think. All right, we, we're gonna do, uh, in a debate, this would be called a lightning round. We have three people and four minutes. Quick question, quick answer. Go ahead, sir, you're next. Hi, Max Holman, ITS. Um, what path can your average citizen take to have an effect on a policy issue in this area? Anyway. Um, is it is it Go about ahead. getting involved with a local organization? Is it about meeting with your local representatives and talking about the issue? What really can help somebody affect change? That's a great question. Go ahead, anyone, quickly. Uh, Go ahead. No. I'll take that really quickly. Um, I, I was thinking in the last question about um, one of the things that to me is incredibly encouraging about school board, Lancaster for some reason has a history of the people who come to school board meetings are really the haters and they hate whoever's on school board and they have nothing but complaints. And in the past couple of years since I've been on, we found more and more parents who love our school district and who are getting involved in terms of just supporting us and I think that um, as an elected official, one of the worst things is apathy on the part of the people. So if you have nobody, and, and that doesn't mean people need to come to school board meetings because they can be rather dull. But I think that for those of us who go from being sort of Joe Schmo to being an elected official, it's really nice to feel like your community does, is interested in certain issues. And I mean, I, you're probably not interested in school board issues yet, but if you are interested in green infrastructure or something, now you know Janine, or you, you maybe might go to a city council meeting, which you've never, you know, maybe done before. Um, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yep, you're, then we'll go to the gentleman. Yeah, actually, it's going to be to expand a little bit on that. I'm Charlie, I'm a freshman. Um, <clears throat> um, my mom works on the local government and my, where I'm from on the education level. What do you see as directly FNM community doing to help support your next movements in the education system? Yeah, I know we already we already do have a lot of students who volunteer in our schools, and I think that they probably learn as much or more than the students that they work with. Um, I think that's a great thing. I think getting involved with the local economy center too. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done there that. Um, and that doesn't apply just to Lancaster, it applies to home and wherever you may go on to have children, 
um, if you do, and, mm -hmm. and suddenly realize that the schools, you know, are important. Anybody else on the volunteer thing? We one more question. We've got two minutes. Go ahead, sir. My name is Charles Lane. I live in Lancaster Township. Uh, I was uh, very interested uh, during the time that um, uh, the discussion was about the convention center and that whole business. And I thought that this uh, subject of who is the power here in Lancaster that was uh, revealed very much in that whole uh, situation and uh, I consider it to be a semi-fiasco, but anyway, others can have a comment about that. Th thank you. That question, in case you didn't hear it, has to do with the convention center and uh, as I like to put it, Ed Rendell, former Governor Rendell, never saw a convention center he didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead, anybody. I don't know if that's something anybody could Antonio, did you do any studies of the impact of that at all? Uh, no, there are studies right and left. You know, yeah, I mean, I you can so, make the yeah. numbers come out one way or another. What I found most interesting about the convention center is the kind of, you know, shift that that represented in local city politics uh, to concentrate economic development, you know, downtown. At, there used to be a time when economic development was more directed at neighborhoods, you know, where there were pockets right. of poverty. Uh, that seems to be a thing of the past around here. It's all about, you know, real estate, right. high real estate values. And I think that fit right into that. Um, and, you know, so uh, I, I do think you're right. That episode spoke eloquently to how things happen, what happens, and what doesn't happen. Final comment. Final comment is to thank you, Dr. Madonna, My and pleasure. our panelists. I hope to see everybody next week. And don't forget, if you haven't registered to vote, there is a table right there. Thank you.